Sometimes there's some perks of being a pastor's kid, and here's one of them. Today is my daughter's birthday. And she's totally picking her nose right now while everybody's looking at her. <laughs> but if you see her outside on Main Street today, would you do me a huge favor? She's dressed like uh, a princess today because she is a princess. But uh, wish her a happy birthday. She's three today. It is crazy. I heard somebody say not too long ago that when you're a parent, the days are long. And I said, amen to that. But the years are short. And I could not agree more. I mean, I'm only, my son will be five next year, but I'm only five years into this, and I can't believe how fast it went. I can only imagine what it's like watching your kids grow up and get married and, and things like that. I can't imagine how fast that goes. But anyway, a little shameless plug for my daughter over there because she's the best. So if you see her, say happy birthday to her. She would really appreciate that. Um, and she loves presents too, so if you want to get her a present, she'd be <laughs> more than happy to deal with that as well. But anyway, I just got to make a little room here. So yes, uh, last week we kicked off a new series titled Broken Promises. And what we've been doing or we're going to be doing in this series is looking at some of these broken promises that we face and finding out how God's word can help us and equip us to move through our hurt and find healing. We've said last week that all of us in some way have dealt with the hurt of a broken promise, whether it's a promise that somebody broke with us, whether it's a promise that we broke with ourselves, or when it feels like God's broken a promise with us. There's, there's all these areas of our lives where we're left in some kind of hurt because of that broken promise. And so what we want to do is we want to see, okay, if we're left in this hurt, how can we move through this? Because God doesn't want us to stay stuck in our hurt he doesn't want us to stay stuck in our pain. He says in John 10:10 10, 10, that I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. So how can that be true if we're looking at our lives right now and feeling like there's all this hurt, there's all this pain? Well, maybe it's because we're stuck in the hurt from our broken promises. So last week we talked about how we can move through our hurt and find healing when someone breaks a promise with us, you know, whatever that may be. And we talked about how oftentimes the thing that keeps us stuck in our hurt of that broken promise is the fact that we feel really insignificant significant, right? We feel like, well, if I was worth it to that person, they wouldn't have broken that promise with me. And so we kind of stay stuck in that feeling of insignificance. And we looked at how God's word says, wait a minute, no, your insignificance is not your identity. Your identity comes through Jesus Christ. And so we looked at who, it really, who God really made us to be through Jesus Christ. And we said that's how we move through that hurt of that broken promise from someone else is, is we don't allow that insignificance to be our identity. We allow Jesus Christ to be our identity. And that's where it comes from. And no one can ever take that away. And so today what I want to do is I want to talk about how we move through the hurt to find healing when we break a promise with ourselves. Now I think this is a, a huge one for us because I think all of us have broken plenty of promises with ourselves, right? And so, like I did last week, I asked for uh, my advisory team, the staff, to give me some great examples of what it looks like to break a promise with ourselves. And so I want to kind of set the tone here. Let me give you some examples, because it might be hard to wrap our minds around. But here's what, what the staff came up with. Ready? Here's a broken promise. I'm not going to steal my kids' candy anymore. And the midnight craving comes, and you do. And all of a sudden, the bucket is empty. But I thought you should know that was Pastor Jeff's broken promise. So <laughs> if nothing else, pray for him and buy his kids some candy because they're obviously out. So, um, but yeah, right? We're not going to do that anymore, but we do. How about this one? I'm going to get up early tomorrow and work out. <laughs> obviously, I never break that promise, but I'm sure that other people have broken that promise with themselves at times. But yeah, right? How many times have we said, okay, tomorrow I'm going to set that alarm. I'm going to get up. I'm going to work out. And then the alarm goes off and it's like, oh, maybe five more minutes, right? And all of a sudden five more minutes turns into we're 10 minutes late for work and it never happens. But how about this is another one, right? This year I'm going to get organized. Yeah, I heard a couple, mm. I'm sorry, right? We say, this is the year I'm going to get systems, and I'm going to work on a budget, and I'm going to do all these things, and I'm going to have files, and all this, and then all of a sudden, it's December 31st, and you're like, oh, maybe next year. You know, we'll get there. How about this one? This is one of my favorites. Diet starts Monday. Right, exactly, and then Monday comes, and it's, uh, I meant next Monday, or, or the following Monday, three Mondays from now. Here's another one. I noticed there's a lot of food ones in here for broken promises, so I think there's something to that. But here's another one, right? I'm never eating that again. I'll be honest, this one was mine. 
Generally, that's how I feel after I polish off a Crave case from White Castle. Uh, I always say, I'm never eating that again until the next opportunity comes. And what do we do? We eat it again. I mean, how can you say no to the Craves? Oh, gotta love the sliders. Here's another one. I'm going to bed earlier from now on. I'm going to get some good rest. From now on, I'm not going to stay up all night. I'm going, to, I'm going to make sure I make it a priority to get good sleep every single night. And then all of a sudden, you look at the clock, and how did it get to be 2 in the morning? Right? Broken promise. Here's another one. I'm going to start reading my Bible regularly. Ooh, silence. <laughs> oh, that was great. I'm going to start reading my Bible regularly. And all of a sudden, it's not happening which might be a great time for me to remind you that you should sign up for our reading plan that we're doing through this series on uh, our identity in Jesus Christ. You can get to it right through our Facebook page. We've got a bunch of people doing it. It's been an awesome, uh, awesome time. So you can still do that if that's one of your promises that you've made and maybe not been the best at following through. Here's a few more. I'm not going to lose my temper like that again. I'm not going to lose my temper like that again. And then the buttons get pushed, and you do. Or this one. I'm not going to drink that again. Or, I'm not going to look at that anymore. How often do we say things like that? I'm not going to drink like that again. I'm not going to look at that anymore. And then, sadly, we find ourselves in the midst of that again. You know, I don't know about you, but what are some of those promises that you make with yourself that you tend to break on a regular basis? Some of those ones that, that you know that, that you're going to make that promise and you're going to try really hard, but unfortunately, you don't always keep the promise. What are they for you? I mean, I'm sure if I asked you to shout them out, the list would be endless. But we all have those promises that we make in our lives to ourselves that we break. And, and I want you to be thinking about that as we, we talk this morning. What are those specific promises? We talked last week about how you can't heal something that doesn't have a name. So if you're stuck today in the herd of a broken promise that you made with yourself, you know, you need to name it first. You have to understand what it is. What's that promise that you're breaking? And now I also want you to think about how do you feel when you break that promise? What are some of the emotions that you wrestle with? What's some of the thoughts that go through your mind when you're stuck in the hurt and the pain of that broken promise? How does that make you feel? Well, I don't know about you, but I feel similar to how Paul feels in the book of Romans. So if you have your Bible, why don't you open up to the book of Romans. We're going to read Romans 7. We're going to start at verse 15, and we're going to go all the way to chapter 8, verse 3. And as we read this, I want you to think about these verses through the lens of a broken promise with yourself. And I want you to think about if that's how you feel when you break a promise with yourself. Ready? Here we go. Romans 7, 15, he says, I don't understand what I'm doing. I already can relate. It says, for I do not do what I want. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I do what I don't want, I agree that the law is good. But now it's no longer me doing it, but sin that lives in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me that's in my flesh. For I want to do the good, but I can't do it. I do not do the good I want, but I do the very evil I do not want to do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it's no longer me living, or me doing it, but sin that lives in me. Let's pray. Father, this is a touchy subject today. Lord, it's so much easier to look at how other people hurt us, but it's a lot harder to look at how we hurt ourselves because we have to take some responsibility when we do that. And so, Father, I know that for those of us here today who have found ourselves stuck in the hurt of a broken promise from ourselves, we're going to need to take some responsibility today. And so, Father, I pray that you would give us the courage and the boldness to do that. That, Father, we would name the promises that we're breaking we would name the hurt that we're experiencing. And we would take the steps to move through it. Father, I thank you that we don't have to figure this out on our own. 
I thank you that you don't just leave us here to fend for ourselves, but that you truly give us the ways that we can step out of our hurt and step closer to you. I thank you for that, Lord. Father, I thank you for this opportunity that we have this morning to open your word. Father, I pray we would never take it for granted. Thank you for the protection, the safety that we have in you. Father, I pray you'd be with us now, that you would protect our hearts and protect our minds from the distractions, from the lies that might be thrown at us in this place and allow us to fix our eyes on you. Father, allow us to engage today. And Father, I pray for, for those of us that are in this room today that are wrestling with knowing if you're even true or real. Father, I pray that today would be a day where you show each of us how real you are and how much you love us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Paul opens up this passage and he says, I don't understand. I don't get what I'm doing. I don't want to do certain things, but I end up doing them all the time. I know the things that I want to do, but I don't do them, and the things I don't want to do, I do. Sound familiar to anybody else in here? Sounds like every time I break a promise with myself. And so I don't know about you, but, but I've noticed, here we go, I've noticed something about when I break a promise with myself, right? Here's me, big bald head, <laughs> really unproportionate body, man. Uh, how embarrassing. <laughs> Littler head, much better body. I don't know what I did with the eyes there, but, but there I am, right? Here, here's me, and I make this promise with myself, okay? I'm not going to let my anger get the best of me again, all right? Let's take that one, because that's a real one for me. I'm not going to let the anger get the best of me again. Here's my promise. I make the promise. And I say, all right, here it is. I'm not going to let it happen again. So kind of the day goes on. I make the promise. Things are going really well. You know, I'm, I'm doing great. Things are feeling good. No big deal, no big deal. But now all of a sudden, sub, something happens. People start to push my buttons. And it's always the other people's fault. It's never mine. So they're always doing things that are getting under my skin. They're pushing my buttons. I feel really, like, agitated. I'm able to push it off for a little bit. But eventually, I lose my temper. Boom! Broken promise. Right? So, what happens? I'm not going to do that again. I don't want that to happen. I learned from my mistakes. I'm not going to let it happen. Not going to lose my temper. Not going to lose my cool. Nothing's going nothing's to shake me. Nothing's going to shake me. Somebody pushes my buttons. Boom! Break the promise again. Sound familiar? What happens? I do it again and again and again and again. Broken promise. Broken promise. Broken promise. And all of a sudden, it just feels like I'm stuck on this merry-go-round of a broken promise. And I can't get off. I'm just going in a big circle. Don't want to do it. Won't, don't want to do it. Don't want to do it. I did it. Don't want to do it. Don't want to do it. Don't want to do it. I did it. Sound familiar to anyone else? Does it sound like the promises that you break with yourself nonstop? You have all of the best intentions never to let it happen again but it seems like all the time you don't do the things that you want to do and the things you don't want to do you end up doing. And that's what Paul's talking about here. He's like, I know that there's things that I don't want to do. I know there's things that I want to do, but it seems like every time I try to do them, I end up doing the things that I don't. And now I feel terrible. And now I feel bad. Now I feel hurt. And now I feel stuck. And I think so many of us are stuck in this circle so badly because of our broken promises. And we feel like we just can't get out. But thankfully, Paul doesn't stop with these first few verses. Paul doesn't just say, the things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I do, I don't want to do. But, eh, it's me. 
Paul goes on, and I believe that he gives us the way to break this cycle of a broken promise. So the first thing that I see in this passage, when we read in these first few verses, it's found in 18. He says, I know that nothing good lives in me. I know that nothing good lives in me. That's in my flesh. For I want to do the good, but I can't do it. Here's the first step in, in breaking out of the, the, the circle of, of the broken promise cycle. You've got to be willing to own your inadequacy. You've got to be willing to own your inadequacy. You see, Paul, he says, I know that nothing good lives in me, and, and I'm acting this way. And what's he doing here? He's owning the fact that he's not good enough to keep these promises all the time. He's owning the fact that he's not perfect. He's owning the fact that he's a promise breaker. And you know, I think that unfortunately, one of the things that we struggle with when it comes to breaking free from the, the broken promise cycle is we give ourselves way more credit than we should. Think about it. Because how often, when you're stuck in the, the cycle of this broken promise, do phrases like this, I'm not going to let this happen again. I'm not going to act like this again. I'm not going to do this again. I'm going to work through this. I'm going to overcome this. I'm going to beat this. We give ourselves a lot of credit. But how does that work for us? We break the promise. Why? Because we are not good enough to keep the promise ourselves. We are not good enough to be perfect every single time. But yet so often we stay stuck in our hurt, we stay stuck in our inadequacy because we feel like we should have been. I should have been able to stand against this struggle. I should have been able to say no. I should have been able to put it down. I should have been able to turn it off. I, 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 I. And Paul says, look, I know that there's things that I don't want to do, and I know there's things I want to do, and I don't do them. I'm not good enough. He's owning his inadequacy. He's owning the fact that he can't do it. I got to let you in on a little secret that God showed me. In the biblical narrative, in the, the story of the Bible, we're not the hero. <laughs> we're not. Okay? But the problem is, we tend to read this book thinking that it's all about us and what we're going to do to make everything and everybody better. But we are not the hero. This book was not written to prove how good we are. It was written to prove how good he is. And so we've got to stop acting like we're the miracle worker. We can't fix this. He can. But when you don't own your inadequacy, when you keep thinking that you're going to be the one that makes everything better, you're going to be the one that keeps every promise, you'll just keep saying stuck in this circle because you'll never get out when you're trying to do it, because you'll never get it right every single time. Paul says, nothing good lives in me. I'm a mess, is what he's saying. And I wonder how many of us even feel the freedom in our lives to admit that we're not perfect. And that's why we stay stuck, because we think, I've got to be the one that does this. And we were never intended to fulfill that role. Our names are not written in here as the rescuer. We're the ones that need to be rescued. So we've got to own our inadequacy and say, you know what? I'm not good enough to fix this. Because you know why? If we were, we wouldn't need Jesus. We wouldn't. Because we could just be Jesus. Jesus. And we can't. That's why he died. So you want to start to break out of the, the cycle of the broken promise with yourself? Own your inadequacy. Recognize the fact that you're not good enough to break this on your own. 
You're not good enough to keep every promise on your own. It won't happen. But then, one of the tensions that we're going to face when you own your inadequacy is that you have to be careful to not use it as a crutch. You can't use your inadequacy as a crutch, but rather you need to use your inadequacy to drive you, not define you. Use your inadequacy to drive you, not define you. Look at verses 24 and 25. Listen to what Paul says. He says, wretched man that I am. So there he is again, owning his inadequacy. I'm not good enough. I'm not a great person. Wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? 25. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Other translation, it says, thanks to God for delivering me through Jesus Christ. You see, you want to break through this, this cycle of broken promises with yourself. You've got to allow that inadequacy to drive you, not define you. See, Paul, he says, look, I'm a wretched man. Look, I fall short. Look, I break these promises. Look, all this stuff happens to me. But I love the fact that he goes on to say, who will rescue me from this? Jesus Christ. He allows his inadequacy to drive him, not define him. He doesn't just say, oh well, I'm an addict. Oh well, I'm damaged goods. Oh well, I'm a wretch. But he says, no, I am those things, but I know someone who will rescue me and deliver me from them. And so he says, I'm going to go pursue him. But we stay stuck in our inadequacy when we allow that inadequacy to define us. Let me let you in on another little secret. Failure is an event, not a person. You are not a failure. You are a child of the king. Do you have moments where you fall short? Absolutely. But that's why we need Jesus. And we've got to be willing to own our inadequacy, own the fact that we're going to fall short, but allow that inadequacy to drive us closer to him, not further away. We can't just sit here and say, I broke this promise again. I'm a loser. Oh well, I might as well just keep doing it over and over and over again. We've got to be willing to step up and say, okay, I fell short. I understand that I broke this promise. What can I do to get closer to him so that we can work through this together? How can your broken promise drive you, not define you? You know, maybe you're sitting here and, and you, know, you said, well, I come from a long line of alcoholics, so I'm, I'm destined to be an alcoholic. I hear that all the time. Well, this is just, this was my life, so it's going to happen to me. Why not look at that and say, knowing what I know and knowing who he is, why can't I run closer to him and allow him to give me the strength to set up some guardrails to drive me to be more like him? Maybe instead of saying, well, I'm an alcoholic, you can say, well, I know that something has happened in my family, and, and if I allow myself to go down the same path that my family did, there's a good chance I might end up like that. Instead of saying, no, there's a good chance that I won't because I'm not going to allow myself to get there, and here's what I'm going to do to stop it. Maybe you're constantly angry. Maybe you're constantly losing your temper. Maybe you're constantly flying off the handle and you say, well, I'm just going to be a raging lunatic for the rest of my life. No, maybe you can take some time to actually see who God made you to be in this book and realize that that's not who you are. And so instead of just letting your anger get the best of you, you can let him get the best of you and do something with your anger. Don't let it define you. Let it drive you. Do something with your inadequacy. Don't just sit in your cycle of self-pity. Otherwise, you'll always always be upset. You'll always be hurt. You'll always be in pain. And Jesus says, no, I've defined you, not this. Amen. Let it drive you. Do something with your inadequacy. Don't use it as a crutch. Paul says, yes, I'm a mess.
will rescue me? Jesus. Jesus will rescue me. What if, what if we looked at our, inadequ- and our inadequacies as opportunities to allow Jesus to move mightily? How would our lives change? Can you imagine? What would happen if instead of us just saying, well, this is who I am, I lose my temper, I'm an addict, I look at things that I shouldn't, I talk the ways that I, can't, I shouldn't, can't change it. What if we said no? Nope, not going to stay there. That's not who I am. This is who I am. And we start to take the steps to say, I'm going to own this and I'm going to use it to drive me closer to him so that as he begins to keep these promises that he makes with us, as he begins to process through this hurt with us and move us farther away from it, we can look back and say, look what Jesus did through me. What if our inadequacies were an opportunity to allow Jesus to move mightily in our lives so that people around us can look and say, I know you couldn't have done that because I saw what happened when you tried. So something else must have happened. And you can say, you're right, let me tell you what happened. What if we looked at our inadequacies as an opportunity to allow Jesus to move mightily? How might our lives change? You want to get out of this cycle of, of a broken promise, this cycle of insignificance? First, you've got to own your inadequacy. Stop trying to be the hero. You're, you're not, no matter how hard you try. Then you've got to allow that inadequacy to drive you, not define you. It's not your crutch. It's your launching point. Then lastly, we've got to understand that when it comes to breaking through the cycle of the broken promise of insignificance, that we're neither the jury nor the judge. We're neither the jury nor the judge. You see, when we look at our broken promises, when we look at the the hurt of the insignificance that we face, we look at how we've fallen short, we look at the things that we've done wrong, We tend to look at our situations, we tend to look at our moments and say, guilty, guilty, guilty. Lost my temper, guilty. Did this again, guilty. I deserve to be punished, guilty. And so we walk around in this self-pity, we walk around in this hurt, we walk around in this pain, and, and oftentimes we're so stuck because we put ourselves in that circle. Because we feel like we deserve to feel hurt. We deserve to feel pain. We deserve to feel like a a loser and like we fall short. We deserve to feel all those things. And so we walk around so unhappy and so upset and feeling like such a failure. We become the jury and the judge. There's the facts. Here's the consequence. You fell short. Be miserable. But you see, when when you own your inadequacy and you, you recognize that, that you're not good enough to do this on your own, but you allow that inadequacy to drive you closer to him so you can work through that hurt, then you allow him, you allow Jesus to be the judge and jury. You know, I was... I shared this a couple times, but I just finished being on jury duty. I, I, I was there for two months, right? I had a big, big, huge case. It was crazy. And the thing the judge kept reminding to us every day in, in jury duty, he said, listen, you're the judge of the facts, but I'm the judge of the law. And, you know, we have to recognize that, that God is the judge of the law, but we had a really great person that stood on our defense, so that we didn't have to be stuck in the cycle of guilt and the cycle of insignificance. Because, you see, here's what happened. We break these promises. We feel horrible. We get stuck. We can't break it out. We recognize that we're inadequate. We recognize that we can't do it ourselves. And Paul says 
that who's going to rescue me? God, through Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say that when you recognize what Jesus did for you, and you say, Father, forgive me, and you surrender your life to him, you allow him to guide you through these promises. Then you see this awesome thing happens. Then we're sitting in the courtroom with all of our broken promises, all of our hurt. We're the ones sitting at the bench. God, the judge, and the jury is standing there, and he's, he's hearing the case, and yep, you lost your temper. Yep. Yep, you did. Yeah, you're having a rough time breaking from that addiction. Yep, you are. Yep, you're, you're a sinner. Yeah. Okay, time to make the verdict. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has come and the new has gone. And Paul says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. So here's what happens. We're sitting in the courtroom, and and the Bible says that that if you've submitted yourself to him, if you've surrendered your life to him, if you'd owned your inadequacies, recognized that you are not good enough and that he is, and you say, you be the leader of my life. Now, when all the evidence has been piled in, all the cases have been made, everything has been put on the table, and it's time for the judge and the jury to make the verdict, and here's what the verdict is. Not guilty. Because if you are in Christ, nothing can separate you from the love of the Father. When you have surrendered your life to him, you will remain not guilty. So you want to break through the cycle of unforgiveness, of broken promises, and pain and hurt. Own the fact that you're not good enough. Own the fact that you can't do it on your own. And let that drive you to the one who can do something about it. And let that drive you to step up and say, this will not define me, because he has. And recognize that you are not the jury nor the judge. And you have no place in condemning yourself. Because just like Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. So now as we close today, I believe that there are some of us here today that have been walking around in the hurt of a broken promise with ourselves for a long time. And we've allowed that hurt to become our identity. We've allowed that inadequacy to become our our identity. And I believe that there are some of us here today that need to surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ today and allow him to free us from that shame, from that guilt, and from that hurt and pain. You know, we talked last week about how when other people break a promise with us, the thing we have to focus on is that we have to get to the point where we can forgive them, not to get them, to give them a chance to get out of what they've done, but to give ourselves the opportunity to move through our hurt and through our pain. Well, here's something that you also need to understand about forgiveness. There's gonna be times in our lives where we need to forgive ourselves. Because one of the biggest reasons we stay stuck here is because we choose to not forgive ourselves and we choose to condemn ourselves. I should have done this. I shouldn't have let that happen. And so we condemn. And so maybe you're here today and you're stuck in the hurt of a broken promise because you can't forgive yourself. And I'll remind you of the same verse I read last week when Jesus was hanging on that cross. He did not yell out, Father, condemn them, but Father, forgive them. And if he can forgive you in the midst of his deepest hurt and pain, how much more can we forgive ourselves in the midst of ours? And so today as we close, maybe you're here and you've been carrying around the hurt of a broken promise for a long time. I want to encourage you today to sit before the Lord and ask him to forgive you. And then I want you to forgive yourself. 
not because you're getting it right, because he got it right for you. And you know, as we close, I, maybe, maybe you need some, some prayer about that. You know, on the, the back of the seat in front of you, there's a, a card with some paper on it. I'd, I'd encourage you to take that card. Be thinking about the promise that, that you've been breaking with yourself nonstop, that you feel like you can't bust out of this cycle of unforgiveness of, this cycle of inadequacy of. Whatever that promise may be, maybe, maybe write it on the card. You know, there's something about actually getting something from your head and onto paper that makes it feel a little more real. And so maybe today, the first step that you need to take in finding that freedom from this broken promise is to put it on the paper and say, God, help me, because today I give up the right to let this broken promise continue to hurt me. Write it on the card. And if you want, you don't have to put your name on it, nothing. If you want to, great, you don't have to. Write it on the card. When the ushers come forward, put it in the basket so that we can take those and we can pray for you. We don't need the names. God knows who you are. But, you know, we pray all the time as a staff, and we would love to walk alongside of you as you work through this promise-breaking cycle. And you ask God to free you from the shame, free you from the guilt, free you from the hurt, so that you don't have to stay stuck in it anymore, and you can find the healing in Jesus Christ. So maybe write it on the paper today. Write it on the paper so that we can come alongside of you and pray for you and lift you up for the Lord to give you that freedom. You know, as the band comes up and plays, and as our ushers make their way forward so we can collect their offering, I want to ask you to, to really sit for a second and, and think about this. You know, don't just, don't just write it off and think, oh, that's great for someone else. No, it's great for you. Jesus died for all of our sins, for each and every one of us. You know, each of us have things in our lives that we're, we're breaking promises of all the time. So why not step up, own up, and free up so that you don't have to walk in this hurt anymore? What promises are you stuck in that you want God to free you from? Write it down and hand it in so we can pray for you. And as, as the offering comes by, I would encourage you to respond to that as well. This is an act of worship that we get to gather here today and we get to give back. We just talked about how God gave everything through his son Jesus to set us free. And you know, when we, we give of our, our finances, we're giving to support the ability for more people to come and to be set free from the same things that he's setting us free from. So I encourage you to respond in generosity and grace so that we could reach the world with the message of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for who you are. Father, I believe that you're already putting on our minds things that have been holding us back for so long, hurt and pain that feels so deep that we can't even imagine or remember what life was like without this hurt. But Father, I believe that through your Son, we can find freedom. And so Lord, as we sit here now, Father, I pray you give us the courage to, to put on paper what it is that we feel like has been holding us back the promise that we feel like we've been breaking time and time again. Father, help us to put it down and give it to you. So we can declare today that in your name, there is no condemnation. Father, thank you that you gave us your son as the hero to our story. Father, if we didn't have him and we didn't have the way that he lived, the things that he accomplished, we would have no hope in finding freedom. But because that tomb is empty, 
we can have hope. And we can have the assurance that when we submit our lives to you, you will never let us go. So Father, please help us to do that today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.